Hi and welcome to Pep Story Live, a show looking at how you can become an outstanding speaker. And tonight we're going to be talking about voice, speaking with clarity. How do you make sure that you have an excellent voice when you're speaking? So speaking with clarity, getting the right voice from when you're speaking. Voices and sound is more important than video. That's the thing I've learned from doing online work for the last five years. <clears throat> and it's what I've learned from, from my own personal experience. I've also been doing voiceover and narrating um, books. And I know very well, because I'm a big audio book consumer. I like podcasts and audio work. I've always enjoyed uh, the, the spoken word. But I know very well that if if I don't like the voice, I'm not going to be able to listen to the book, which is why you actually get some audio books done by two or three different people, because sometimes the voice just doesn't work. And unfortunately, that's not just, you know, the voice doesn't work for any, you know, someone's voice doesn't work for anyone. Yeah, there are some people like certain voices, they don't like others. Um, some accents we prefer. Um, it, it may be that you love a Geordie accent, but you don't like the Welsh accent. I like the Welsh accent, but I struggle with a Liverpool accent. I struggle to understand it. Um, I struggle to understand some of the Midlands accents. And yet we all have different sounds that we, we do and don't like. And so it's not about accent. It's actually more to do with diction, with clarity. And that's really what we want to look at. So we're looking, if we think back now to our five elements, purpose, experience, passion, performance and story, we're focusing in on performance. And this is the, the first and most important element of performance. You have got to, to get that voice right. Now, there is a difference between performing as I am now online and doing an online performance. Uh, I have a microphone very close to me. So uh, I don't really need to push my voice out. If I was on a stage speaking to an audience of 500 people, I I would probably be using a microphone, but if still you've got to push the voice so that it reaches the back. And I was taught when I was doing drama training that you you have to be able to whisper so that the person at the back in the back row can still hear it, even if you're not using a microphone. And a lot of the older theatres were very, very carefully designed so that the sound wraps around and reach people without the necessity for huge amounts of amplification. Today, we tend to stick a microphone and everything and pump it out. But even then, you see, a microphone can't work unless it has something to work with. So it's no point in talking really quietly, and hoping the microphone will pick it up and throw it out. It won't. You have to still push the voice at the same time. That said, my biggest challenge, having learned to speak in you know, theatre and how to speak in a large hall and make sure that people can hear me, I've had to regulate that and moderate that now sitting in front of a camera and a microphone in my dining room where it's an entirely different approach. And it, yeah, definitely early on I was overdoing it. I still probably tend to. Problem is I can't hear what it's sounding like unless I go and listen to uh, the recording and listen back, which I do on a regular basis. So let's have a look at voice. Um, it's our most important tool as speakers. It's the sound that people are going to be listening to. How you project that voice, how you put that voice out is really, really important. And you also have to take care of it. Now, I'm not going to focus on care of voice today. I will look at that actually in another session. And uh, it's just reminding me to, to make sure I put that in. But we all have accents as well, don't we? Just going to take a little drop of water. I was brought up in the West Country. So I have a West Country accent. If I want to, I can rattle, you know, rattle along in a West Country accent the way we're down on the farm in Wiltshire. And I know that if I speak in a broad West Country accent, that people are going to, some people are not going to like that at all. And you'll notice there's changes in the way that certain things are 
pronounced. You roll out the R's a lot more and the A's got, yeah, there's, there's very different sounds. I took drama training and in my drama training, that accent vanished because not suppressed, not gone, just simply that my voice was trained to speak in what's called received pronunciation. That's the English without an accent at all. Uh, Oxford English, not the, the plummy royal family one, because that's actually an accent all of its own. Uh, this is actually about speaking with an accent that is absolutely clear English. Now, you've got to remember that a lot of times when we're speaking, um, we are also speaking to audiences that particularly now, um, I was on an event on Friday and there were people from America there, there were people from India on the same event. Now, American accent, very different to the English accent. Very different words as well. And I'm going to talk about dialect as well in a second. But uh, th there's, this is the, uh, the issue we've got to look at. My job is to try and make sure that when I deliver my speech, you understand it, that it's clear. I don't need, I don't want you to be thinking, what, 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 what did she say? What, what, what was that? What was, what was, because, yeah, that's what happens when we're dealing with there's lots of accents. If I go up to Scotland and I've got a lot of friends in the speaking industry in Scotland, they have mostly learned to, yeah, enunciate more clearly to get rid of the deep, rich, you know, Glasgow accent, which, you know, when Billy Connolly first started as a, as a comedian, people couldn't understand him. He had to, bring that accent, temper that accent so that it actually became more understandable. Not remove it, not get rid of it. He's been known for his Glasgow accent. But um, I remember going to see a workshop with Jack Black, also from Glasgow. Uh, this was a personal development workshop. It was a two-day workshop. I spent the whole of the first half of the first day just tuning into the ear, just trying to understand it. I've lived in Hull now for 20 years. I still struggle if I'm hearing people who have got broad Hull accents, broad Yorkshire accents, broad Birm Birmingham or Liverpool accents. And it's those, the, the problem with English is that it has evolved here up in the north, very, very strongly influenced by Vikings. And in the south, it was the, the Angles and the Saxons um, who yeah, it affected the language. If you go to Scotland, it's Celts. If it's the same with Ireland, and Ireland still it has its own language. So the accent in Ireland is very much yeah, developed out of a Celtic accent and with it Celtic dialect. Certain words that were Celtic still exist in the language. Certain Viking words still exist in the language here in, um, in Hull. Down in Cornwall, that, you know, West Country, another Celtic um, nation. You've, you've got different words in different areas. And this, yeah, one of the things I found if I'm speaking in America, I have to go through and check in my speech. Am I saying things that they're just not going to understand? You now we're talking about the pavement. The pavement we mean here is when we walk along the pavement. But in America, they're going to be it's sidewalk. So if I say pavement, they actually think I mean the road. So really, really important to get that right. So can you see, I mean, it's just one simple word where it's totally, totally different. And there are lots of examples of that where American, the American language has a, is, is an English language, but it's a different dialect. Same in Scotland, same in, uh, if you go to the Northeast, there's a dialect there. If you go to Liverpool, there's, there's words which only exist in those regions. And that makes it more difficult to understand the language. And the same will apply anywhere in the world where people have learned English where did they learn it from? Yeah, a lot of people learn English abroad, but they learn it from American tutors, so they tend to learn an American accent. So those are think we have to try and, when we're speaking, remove from our speech as much as possible things to do with dialect, that is, words which will not be understood outside of our local area, because if we use them, they're not going to be understood. And it's the same with, you know, work. You've got lots of jargon used. It's the same as dialect. If there's lots of jargon used in your work, you have to get rid of those because people won't understand what you're saying. So we've got to get our language right, get our accent, not too rough. Keep the accent. Accents are wonderful. They add richness to your, yeah, they're, they're part of who you are. But you also have to be understood. So it's getting that balance right between the two.
And then we come to diction. And this is the most important thing I want to talk about tonight. How do we speak in such a way that our words are heard clearly? Now, the easiest thing to remember about speaking is try to slow it down. I know I, I speak quite quickly. I'm trying to learn French at the moment. I've been trying to learn French for a very, very long time. But I really, you know, as a result of lockdown, I've been doing a lot more. I've been making sure I do 15 to minutes to half an hour every day, um, either learning some new stuff or practicing it and trying to hear. And I think I'm getting it. It's working OK. And then I listen to some French speech, which is using mostly words I know and I don't understand the word. Because obviously everything blends in together like one continuous run we don't speak each word separately unless i put it on slow so that i can hear the stuff one word at a time but we have to find a way to be able to speak now that's all about our lips we need to move our lips and they need to move <coughs> that you've got to make sure your lips are moving well in order to bring out the sounds now um, I got some coaching years ago from Peter Settlin. You may have heard of Peter. Peter was the uh, P Peter was Princess Diana's coach. He coached her through that very difficult bulimia speech. Uh, he's an actor. He's act, uh, appeared in lots of programs. He's been on Coronation Street and uh, Poirot, a whole bunch of different things. Um, and really, really a good spe good speaker. He was one of the first people who joined the PSA when we first set it up, and. He did some coaching for me and really talked about this whole era of moving your lips. And the way he did it was really, very really simple. I would like you to try this. I mean, I know you'll have people going, oh, my God, that's so embarrassing. Just, just give this a try. Put your tongue out and just do Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb, it fleeth were white as snow. And everywhere Mary went, that lamb was filthy girl. Sounds a bit thick, doesn't it? But what you're trying to do is to get the lips moving. And by speaking with your tongue out, you're in the bathroom and no one's watching you. Just do a simple little thing like Mary had a little lamb. Look, put your tongue out while you're doing it. And that forces you to move your lips to make everything much clearer. Uh, and you'll get a, a, a better sound. Now, in the, sh the show notes for this uh, video, you'll find I've, I've put a list of some practice expressions. These are just sounds that I recommend that you use to, to practice just getting your speech out. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Actors Institute, uh, the mastery course. Uh, I attended the mastery course two or three times, actually. Uh, and I've also attended a leader, mastery leaders course and that the purpose of which is to get people to use performance skills within work it, it's a it's a brilliant course to just bring you out of yourself incidentally all of this information you'll find in peter settlin's book talk to me um and you'll find that i think it's uh it's available as a kindle book and i think it's also available uh as a paperback but um i'm not sure it's available as a uh or audio book, but certainly available as a Kindle book. If you look at talk to me on, uh, uh, I'll try and put the uh, details into the uh, into the show notes later. Anyway, here's some some vocal exercises you can play with. Mana mana mana. Now the M's and N's in English are really important because these are the only two sounds that we call nasal sounds. They go up the nose. You'll notice this if I uh, if I say um, Bada gada, which is the one that's coming up in a minute. Bada gada, bada gada, bada gada, bada gada, bada gada. You'll notice there's no difference. Doesn't matter that my nose is pinched. Bada gada. There's no sound going up my nose. It's not nasal. Now, mana mana mana. Can you see the problem there? The moment I go, that sound is going up my nose. So, if your nose is blocked. This is when all the M sounds, mother, uh, suddenly starts to become mother, and you need to clear. So no sound should go up the nose apart from M and N. So mana, mana, mana. Practice that. Helps to get those nasal sounds moving well. Um, you can play along with me if you want to, or just you know try it later on. You've got the, you've got the list in the, in the thing. Bada gada. Really powerful sounds there, ba da gada, and I use I play with these. You can 
they're meaningless. They're just sounds. So you can add emotion into them. But a gutter. But a gutter. Yeah, just play with it. Be there. They're just sounds which help to make the diaphragm work more effectively, push those sounds out. Wubbada, wubbada. Another sound. So these are just things. And just be very playful. I get people in, in, a, in a group training, a, a coaching session or when doing a public speaking course, I get everybody playing around with these. We talk to each other, just using these strange sounds and just try and convey some emotion and meaning um, w- within them. Wow, we way woo. See? Wow, we way woo. Wow, we way woo. Now, just wow, we. It's a nice vowel sound. You're practicing vowels, pushing the vowels out. And <clears throat> you've got to remember that the sounds in English come from the vowels, A, E, I, O, U, Y. Those are the sounds, the open sound. If you think the, the first sound, the sound, and I, I do this definitely when I want to get people to project their voice, just take two fingers, uh, put your teeth, the, literally two fingers apart, take a deep breath, Ah, and that sound, you can push that, and in a big room, you can push that sound out, so it'll literally rattle the windows at the back of the room. It opens up the airways, and you can push that sound out without straining, without shouting. Once you open your mouth up and let that sound just come, remember, the sound is coming by vibrating the vocal cords, the larynx. So it's the air coming from your stomach, passing over there, which produces the sound. It's it's not in the mouth. It's coming from in the chest. It's coming from, <clears throat> and then it's resonating around the different cavities. So, ta ti te tu, ta ti te tu. Yeah, the consonants t, um, w, w, b, d. These are all the ways in which we stop and start sounds. So we have vowel sounds i u, and those are just simply the sounds. From moving our lips and making this. So, I, you, you see, just make the sound and then move your lips. It changes it to a vowel sound. Then you stop and start it with a consonant. It's, um, and that, if you practice those and play with those sounds, it, it actually, and there's the final one, Wavatatha. Uh, difficult one for some people, Wavatatha. Difficult one for Jonathan Ross. Wavatatha. Uh, and you can play with that. It's definitely very much in the lips, that one. So what I also found then was a group of words. And these are just some sentences which I picked up on a course when I was doing a, a English uh, speaking board uh, course years and years ago. And I found when I was doing uh, workshops that I had one person on a workshop once who I just could not understand properly. And I said, Maggie, just try this. We are all going to Oxford in April. And there's just no way to say that sentence. Um, And if you try to do it without clearly, you know, enunciating all of the vowels, we all will go to Oxford in April. We are all going to Oxford in April. And, you know, every time she said that, immediately afterwards, everything she said was clear as a bell. And that's the thing, the sort of thing I found that people have got a lazy accent. My my own children grew up in in the south of England, where estuary English is the dominant accent, and it's a lazy accent. It's sort of developed, I think, primarily from 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 that sort of teenage grunt um, sound that comes along. And if you've got teenage children, you know um, what it's like. Uh, there's Communication is reduced to grunts and flows. So um, it's like lazy language. Need to get past that and produce it. We are all going to Oxford in April. Just practice saying that. You'll find it starts to improve the way in which you speak automatically. It helps to make each sound clear, each of your consonants, and those are the ones in your lips. Um, it makes them. Um, much clearer, and it makes the sounds much clearer, makes each word, separates them out so that people can understand you much better. Ought we to take Uncle Alfred and Aunt Ethel? Ought we to take, try it. Ought we to take Uncle Alfred and Aunt Ethel? Just pronounce it so that each word is pronounced. You can speed it up if you want. Actually, 
I think they'll arrive by air. And these are all about practicing vowels and helping to make vowels work. Of all the alternatives, I accept the eighth. <clears throat> and two more. Pay attention. Pay every attention to expert advice. Again, you'll find all of these in the links below. These are just phrases and exper uh, to experiment with, to practice, to improve your diction, to improve the, the sound of, of the words that you're forming. And finally, who announced that opera? It was inaudible. Um, who announced that opera? It was inaudible. And you can play, you can shout them, you can whisper them, you can do everything you want with them, but it will help. These are just simple exercises which I know will help to improve your diction, improve the way in which you can use your voice. If people can't understand what you're saying, they very quickly switch off. When you do a video, people will listen. If they can't hear, if they don't like the voice, they're gone in seconds. Literally, within 30 seconds, they say, oh, I can't handle that, and they go. Bad sound, bad voice, all of these contribute to people saying, no, can't do that. When I'm searching for a book, and I, I know I've talked to lots of people who said the same thing, they click on the sample and they think, oh, no, no, I can't listen to that for hours. And that's it. They're gone. They would love to get the book, but they can't have the voice just doesn't work for them. So you have to work on that voice. If you're doing podcasts, if you're doing online presentations, if you're going to be speaking to large audiences, they have to be able to hear you. So speak it. Do a show. Listen back. Hear what your sound is like. See what you can do then to improve it so that it becomes clearer. And that's what you're looking for. Speak with clarity so that people don't have to work hard to understand what you're saying. It just flows naturally and easily and they can hear you. It's not abrasive, just a nice, good, gentle voice, very clear so they get all of the words. And that's moving those lips, getting those lips moving. If you need to get up in the morning practice, you know, give yourself a good face massage. <clears throat> Do some, wow, oh, just, just get those vowel sounds moving and then try some of these. Those are great ways. And if you want, yeah, maybe have a little nap. All good exercises in front of the bathroom. Family will think you've gone mad, but don't worry. You'll become a better speaker for it. Join me tomorrow, day 18 of my challenge. And don't forget, if you want some coaching just to help you get your pet TEDx talk together, get that keynote together, get that board presentation, doesn't matter what it is. Um, I'm happy to do a 30 minute introductory session with you so you can see how I would be able to help you. Just drop me a line, ricky at rickyarundel.com, and I'll be more than happy to help you. Tomorrow, we're going to be doing a little bit more about performance. Um, in fact, most of this week, we're going to be talking about how to perform speeches better. Hope you've enjoyed tonight. Um, and I see a few people just joined us. It's available on replay in about a couple of minutes late time. So uh, no problem. Thank you much for being with me. And I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Take care.